Let's now begin our journey into Azure networking and we begin with this network overview which will give you the basics that you need to understand the core fundamentals in Azure virtual networks. Well, let's begin with this diagram. You'll come across this from time to time in your discussions with Microsoft Azure as you continue to engineer and architect networks. You'll learn the concept of the hub and spoke model, which is depicted here on screen. On the left, you can see we have the on-premises network. And in the middle to the right of the screen, we have the hub virtual network, as well as these various spokes on the right-hand side. The hub virtual network is where we keep a lot of management services or services that we use to connect back to other networks. These could be your on-premises network or perhaps VPNs into other Azure networks in other regions if needed. There are things like global peering and new services that have become available, but you can still connect through gateways to other networks as well. But what you can see in particular is we have these spokes on the right-hand side with spoke one virtual network there. We have spoke to virtual network there. And then you can see we have our hub again in the middle there. And these are all connected together through what we call virtual network peering. Also something we'll go into a little bit more detail around later on. But this essentially allows us to connect those networks together. And so connections from spoke one virtual network, those virtual machines there can connect into the hub network, perhaps for management services. Perhaps we have an Active Directory server running in the hub virtual network that those VMs need access to as an example. But all in all, this is the typical diagram that you will see. But let's dive in a little bit more into VNets themselves. Let's zoom into say one of those spokes where we have a VNet. And what is a VNet essentially? Well, the VNet is the main construct there that we will put resources in. And then we'll put our subnets inside of those virtual networks. So we could have subnet A, for example, and subnet B all located inside that same virtual network. You have an address space for the VNet and you have address space for the subnet. So again, you can have multiple subnets in that VNet. Obviously, you can't have two subnets with the same address space in the same VNet. You would carve out the VNet address space into various subnets as you go through. You also then are able to connect subnet A to subnet B. They're in the same virtual network, so they can absolutely connect and talk to one another. And then if we want to start to filter traffic, we can use things like network security groups, which act as a firewall, essentially to say that, you know, traffic from subnet B, can it reach subnet A or not? You know, you decide based on the rules that you create in those network security groups. Another topic we'll get more and more into later on. So let's talk about some of the core virtual network capabilities to, to round out this discussion. Well, one, uh, they are isolated by default. So if you create a VNet, you can create multiple VNets all with the same address space in them. Uh, as long as they can't connect to each other, you're not going to really have any problems. They're just isolated virtual networks with their own address space in them. Uh, it's only when you start peering them and connecting them to each other in other ways where you have to think about the overlap in address space problem that you would run into. But otherwise, they're isolated, which also means they're a security boundary from that perspective as well. They provide internet access out, and you can also provide internet access in through public IP addresses as well. Uh, Azure resource connectivity, they allow connectivity through all our Azure resources, as you will see and you know continue to expand when you build in virtual machines, when you build in storage, things like that, you can connect them into the VNets themselves. They provide on-premise connectivity through the various mechanisms that are available in hybrid connectivity scenarios. They also have the traffic filter capability through things like network security groups, and they have routing capabilities as well. There's some default route behavior that's built in, and then you have some additional user-defined routing capabilities that you can do as well, but they take care of all that for you. And last but not least, you can connect virtual networks together, which again, we will get more into later on. Let's now talk about the IP address space in a little bit more detail. Well, for one, any IP address range defined in RFC 1918, example 10.0.0.0 slash 16, uh, it's using standard address space that you're pretty familiar with from existing networking concepts. You cannot add the following address ranges, uh, 224.0.0.0 slash 4, which is the multicast address. We have the broadcast address, all of our 255s there, because that would broadcast throughout the subnet. Uh, the loopback address, 127.0.0.0, that you're probably familiar with. Uh, 169.254.0.0, that's our link local address. 
and 168.63.129.16 uh, for internal DNS. So none of those addresses can be used inside your networking, just like per normal networking constructs. Uh, public IP addresses can also be attached to your Azure resources as well as you know what you've got in the the private space that you're creating in the VNet and the subnets. Let's take a moment now just to talk about Azure reserved IP addresses and this is really really important because Azure reserves five IP addresses within each subnet. So in a typical subnet these could be the .0 address to begin the subnet up to .3 as well as the last address of the subnet. And these are allocated as follows. One, we would have that network address, which if we had a network that was 10, 0, 0, 0, the network address is that 10, 0, 0, 0 address because that's indicating the network itself. That's not a usable address. Then you have your default gateway, which would be 10, 0, 0, dot 1. And then you've got dot 2 and dot 3 that are reserved for DNS mapping services. And last but not least, you would have the dot 255, which would be your broadcast address when you want to broadcast traffic across the entire subnet. So very, very important to know that you do lose five addresses, you know, if you take these into consideration. Let's also then talk about public IP addresses. Now, public IP addresses allow internet resources to communicate inbound to those Microsoft Azure resources. They also will enable Azure resources to communicate outbound to the internet and Azure public facing services. You may be wondering, well, can't I just communicate outbound anyway? Yes, you absolutely can. We use source NATIN. So when you have a resource or a VM and it's in a virtual network, it can absolutely talk out to the internet uh, and it uses network address translation to basically allow that VM to communicate out. Uh, but if you put an IP on for a public IP, I should say, then you absolutely obviously can communicate out through that public IP address as well if you want to. Uh, example services you can assign a public IP to are as follows a virtual machine network interface card. So note that when you build virtual machines in Azure and you sign the PIP, the public IP address, you will sign it to the NIC that gets attached to the virtual machine. Public facing load balancers can be assigned the PIP, VPN and application gateways, as well as the Azure firewall service as well. There are two SKUs available that you need to consider when choosing your public IP address. You have the basic SKU, and you have the standard SKU. Now the basic one was the default before the introduction of SKUs. You just had the basic public IP address option. Uh, it was assigned with static or dynamic allocation. So the difference there being dynamic is allocated when say the virtual machine is instantiated, starts up. When you stop it or deallocate the machine, it will actually remove the public IP address there. It's not going to necessarily give you the same one with static, it's what it says on the tin, it's statically assigned to that particular unit. Uh, they are open by default, the basic SKU, but NSGs are absolutely recommended. If you just do a basic public IP address and you don't have any NSGs on there, you effectively have put, say, a virtual machine out there completely open uh, and you're at the mercy of the machine's firewall and authentication mechanisms. They're assigned to any Azure resource that allows a PIP. So you'll see in the standard one, there's a few more restrictions there, but on the basic one, any resource that allows a public IP is fine. They do not support availability zones, which have been coming into the various regions in Azure. So that means that in some regions, you have the option of multiple data centers in that region. Uh, those are not supported with the basic SKU today. If we shift over to the standard SKU, uh, this is the preferred method over basic SKU since the introduction. So uh, if in doubt, uh, or just generally, choose the standard SKU now. They always use the static allocation method when they are assigned versus the dynamic option that you had in basic. They're secure by default and they are closed to all inbound traffic right out the gate. They're assigned to NICs, standard load balancers, or application gateways. So I mentioned there, few restrictions there on where you can assign the standard SKU to. Uh, network interface cards that are attached to a VM goes without saying, those are still there. Uh, and then you have the option of assigning them to the standard load balancer, which you'll learn more about load balancing later on, or application gateways. They do now support availability zones and can be zone redundant or zonal. You have some choices there.
Let's now review some of the key points for virtual networks before we wrap up this lecture. Uh, for one, just remember they are the primary building block for Azure Network in almost everything we do in Azure. When we want to connect services to each other, when we want to build virtual machines, when we want to you know, connect even Azure app services, etc., to other services, they're going to send their traffic across the virtual network. The private network in Azure based on an address space prefix. And remember, you create your subnets in your VNet with your own IP ranges. Your address space is then broken up into subnets. So again, you've got the address space for the VNet, and then you break it up into your subnets. Watch for those reserved addresses. Remember, Microsoft reserves five IPs uh, in every subnet. So when you calculate in your subnet space, make sure you understand that. The smallest possible subnet, a slash 29, will only give you three usable IP addresses. So again, make note of those reserved IPs. And virtual networks are tied to an Azure subscription and they exist within a specific region. That's not to say we can't connect out from them to virtual networks in other regions with various technologies, but by default, when you build a virtual network, you're going to put it in a subscription within a specific region. So with that, this wraps up our overview of Azure Virtual Networking, and I encourage you to continue reading up about it as well as getting your hands dirty and jumping in, you know, and building a virtual network, building some address space, just so you're familiar with how everything works there.